Good day fellow investors. The new JPM Guide to Markets is out for the US, EU, Asia. So we'll cover that to give an overview of what's going on by using their beautiful charts about all kind of topics. And then we'll discuss the probability of a stock market crash in 2022, especially as there is so much noise about it. The fact that returns will be lower than ever given the valuations, that's mathematics. And you can check a video about index fund investing that I made on Peter Lynch's comments about index funds. And all the videos that I mentioned here will be in the links in the description below for deepening your insights into the topics. Then we'll touch on the economy. It's not that great as it looks like, which is very, very interesting. Inflation, of course, is it here to stay? How much does it really matter? And then it comes always, US stocks keep going up, up and up, no matter the daily downturns. But will that continue? And is it smart now to start really investing elsewhere, especially as the dollar is strong and US stocks are very, very high? If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoyed the content, please smash that like button, consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell so that every Saturday when a video comes out, you get notified. If not, the YouTube algorithm simply kills me because I don't publish seven videos a day. Let's start with discussing the chances of a stock market crash in 2022, especially now as the Fed is rushing into hiking, is rushing into tapering less money into the system because the economy is so great. Now, just a comment on the Fed, the latest minutes that just came out that on Wednesday crashed the market. The Fed is always saying to test also, and then they adjust depending on the data. If the market crashes 20% by March on the expectation of free rate hikes tapering, then the Fed will say, okay, we can't really taper or do that. Then we have to change things, less spending on market. So it's all an evolution. Don't ever trust the Fed or what they say at a fixed point in time. Look at over history, their actions and then their reactions on what changes. The market, of course, it's extremely high when you look at this chart, just going up, up and up since 2009. COVID was just a blip here, nothing important. But if we look at valuations, the forward price earnings ratio is 21.2. Of course, it is double what it was in 2009, so you have to expect mathematically lower returns. More about that later. However, that 21.2 valuation is based on analyst estimates for amazing earnings growth over the next two, three years. So earnings for the S&P 500 are expected to 2x since 2017. That's half a decade and 2x. That's a really, really incredible performance. And the key there is an increase in margins. So companies are making more and more money selling the same products, doing, let's say, cost-efficient, lower debt. So companies are simply more profitable. The question is, will that be sustained over time or not? That's something we'll have to see. Of course, if you compare to 2000, the price earnings ratio was 25. That's also relatively high. And then 12 years of zero returns have followed. So we can be into something like that too. If we look at real chances, if you look at the annual declines, the crashes, over the last 40 years, there have been five crashes. And that is a given. There is not much you can do about it. I can guarantee you there will be more stock market crashes in the future. That's something we have to accept. Five bad years, let's say in 40 years, that means statistically that there is a 12.5 chance for a stock market crash of above 20%, even a little bit more in 2022. That's simple mathematics and that's something you have to accept. If not, don't invest in stocks, very easy. The thing is that you can't really predict when it's going to happen. Can we have another crash in 2022? Yes. Can we have the next crash in 2029? Yes, nobody can really predict it. Now everyone expects the Fed to taper higher interest rates. That might 
crash stocks because everything is compared to alternatives, treasuries, etc. And that might crash the market, but then you never know what the Fed will do and when it will change its mind. Last year there was no inflation, now they're panicking about inflation. Who knows what will they say or think or fart in June of 2022. Also, if you look at longer term, then you can see that in the 60s, 70s, 80s, crashes would happen more often. So that's also a possibility that one has to think about when it comes to investing. Of course, crashes were bigger and getting larger. So if something happens in the next five years and it's of this magnitude, then it's more significant than something of 20-28% of lower magnitude. Of course, now the Fed is intervening, not allowing for crashes, so they are preparing things for the big crash if they lose control. Of course, when we talk about crashes, we have to always keep in mind nominal and real returns. There can be an inflationary crash that is also discussed in another video, and I'll put it in the link in the description below, where stocks keep going up because Owning businesses is great protection uh, against inflation, but you have to always compare real returns. If inflation is 10% and your return is 10%, then your return is zero and real return. And that's also something to keep in mind when it comes to investing. Of course, 10% is better than having cash and losing 10% by devaluation of cash. Of course, projections. The blue line is the Fed's projection for interest rates. And you can see that the market already disagrees with the Fed. They say, okay, maybe to 1% in 2023, then to 1.3, but you will not be able to push it to 2%, 2.5. So this is rhetorics, these are real expectations. But the Fed is testing and seeing how this will impact economics, spending, financing, environment, all the data that they are looking at and they are trying to, let's say, keep things stable. The truth is that they can lower rates, but now they are really at zero. They tried here and now we're again at zero. We'll see how far can they go with this tapering rhetorics. So there is a chance, 12 to 20 percent chance for a 20, 30 percent crash in 2022. 2023, the chances increase, of course, that's normal. The key question is, can you handle a crash? Of course, if you are invested in stocks, you have to always accept that as a given and then say, okay, yes, my portfolio can crash and that is investing. If not, then it wouldn't be giving 10% per year over the last decades and that is as simple as that. You can try to own different things globally for perhaps better margin of safety from a business perspective investing, but more about that later. And then actually, I think that a stock market crash would be great for 95% of the population. All those people that are still investing in stocks from your paycheck, from your savings, investing, building a portfolio, then the lower stocks are, the better it is for you. And you can enjoy this video for more info about that. The fact is that crashes are temporary situations that hit most your emotions. But when a stock market crashes, most of the businesses keep doing business, keep working, keep growing, keep building in those cycles. And if you own good businesses, you're happy with the crash because you can accumulate more. And I want to really show you how important that is. This is perhaps the most important thing when it comes to investing. If we have an initial investment of 100,000, a monthly contribution of, let's say, to make it easy, 500, and then we do that over 20 years, the estimated interest rate, let's say the return, let's start with 10% and then compare with 5 and 15%. If we calculate that, and if we look at the returns, if we start with 100,000, if we get to 15,000, we get to 2 million. 10% is 1 million and 5% is 463,000. Those are huge differences for long-term investing. And that's why we have to focus on getting better and better returns because that is what matters. 
One crash in there doesn't really matter, especially if you have that long-term investing horizon. And returns over the long term depend on valuations. So that's something we have to keep in mind as long-term investors. Valuations are high, thus no matter crashes, returns are likely to be low long-term. If we look at valuations, of course, we are now at let's say relative historical highs, those that invested in the early 2010s did really good because valuations were low and returns were high. With valuations high, the most likely outcome is for returns to be low. If you look at real returns from the current valuations, this is five year returns, you can see that real returns, annual returns are pretty, pretty low. If you are positive, you are lucky. Of course, the distribution of what can happen in one year is really crazy, but over the longer term, you see the determines there. If we look at, at 10 year total annualized returns, then you can see that P ratios of 20, it means simply low returns total returns. That is how it has worked in the past. And then again, something to accept and compare to other opportunities. Of course, the market can still do amazingly over time, but the chances are lower for that. The current level of global stocks valuations are lower and you can see that then you can expect higher returns there given that the valuations are lower. And as we said, the difference in that 5% per year based on business or not is a decision you have to make because it has a huge impact over your long-term financial well-being. The current reason for the high valuations is that growth stocks are hot. We are living such in a technology light asset business models, so high margins as we have seen, value is getting cheaper in relation to growth as growth companies can scale globally and therefore have higher margins. Will that ever change? Will these margins revert to historical means? Depends on the competition or regulation on taxes, which are things, again, we can't really predict. And then if you look again at the index concentration, the top 10 weight in the S&P 500 is 30 so you have 567 stocks in the S&P 500 and the top 10 make 30% while the other 496 make just 69.5%. Also the earnings contribution there is the highest so we have this centralization of businesses in an index where the bigger get bigger while the remaining world isn't doing as well. But if you look at the long term, it's still best to be in stocks because simply stocks give you that inflation protection, give you the growth, give you the owning businesses. And if you look at total returns in real terms over 100 something years, there are ups and downs with stocks, but you're definitely going to lose money with cash, you're definitely going to lose money with bonds, and stocks are the place to be. The only question is which stocks? If we look at global indexes, so again, stocks have done really better, and this is an example of how much you gain by reinvesting your dividends and compound the businesses over time. Of course, over a year anything can happen as we discussed with investing in stocks with the crash section. So in one year stocks can go down 40%, can go up 50%, that's a given. But over the long term it is likely that stocks will deliver from 6%, which is the current expectation on valuations, to possible even 17%, even if very, very unlikely. And this is how you have to compare your other opportunities. Of course, if you need the money in a year, two years, then stocks are not the place to be, even if you will lose by inflation. But this is the problem and this gets to most investors. They try to anticipate markets, they try to sell, they try to buy at the right time, they try to shift from this to that. 
And over the last 20 years, the average investor return was 2.9% compared to the S&P 500 of 7.5%. So by trying to do, by trying to outsmart the market or something like that, the average investor loses money. If you're looking at this macroeconomics overview video to try to get an advantage over the market, then you will likely lose money and have lower than expected returns because you will do the wrong thing at the wrong moment in time. And therefore, I prefer investing in businesses, looking at those returns, and that's also what we are looking now, and then also at the long-term risks. Okay, how can I position myself long-term to get those few percentage points higher returns? Sounds boring, but as we have seen here, it is extremely important and that is what makes the difference a few percentage points per year not these stocks or index funds or whatever so to conclude on valuations margins returns the valuations are sky high the returns will likely be low but investing now especially in those highly priced exuberant stocks is a bet on the fed is a bet on the fed protecting your behind and if the market crashes saying, okay, we're going to flash more money into the system, we're going to allow for inflation to keep the financial system alive as it is. Ray Dalio says that it is unlikely that the Fed will be able to do that forever, which creates a significant risk for investors, something that we'll discuss in a moment in the economic section. What we can do is figuring out the risk of a specific business, investing, accepting the ups and downs in the short term, and watching those businesses develop over time, and seeing, understanding the business, not the stock price, whether the business is delivering on expectations, and whether the business will lead us to our goals. And then also, starting now is the best time to start to think about insurance, about risk, because will the Fed or the ECB be able to keep things as those are for another year, five years, 10 years, but at some point they will lose control like we're already seeing some glimpses when it comes to inflation. And this is something very important, interest rates and equities. So at a certain moment in time, when interest rates go up, everything is good. The economy is great, employment, everything is good. But at a certain point, interest rates go too high and then likely lead to an economic contraction. The thing is that that started happening before 2009 at an interest rate of 4.5%. But now it's already 3.6%. What if in the next decade it already starts at 1.6%? And that's a question we will get the answer in the future. But interest rates is going lower and this breaking point when, okay, we can't increase interest rates anymore, is getting lower and lower. And then the economy is doing great, it's getting hot, inflation, employment, unemployment is low, the Fed is talking about hiking, becoming hawkish, everything looks so great. But is the situation really that great with economics? Let's check. If we look at real GDP for, in this case, the United States, the trend growth is 2% but it hasn't been then that miraculous over time, especially now with the COVID crash, it still hasn't rebounded. And we have to see whether it will jump above the trend or will the trend be lower over time. The thing is that the GDP is based on government spending and individual consumptions. Net exports are negative. So 4% of US wealth is going away every year. Of course, US, great technology, great businesses, doing business globally, and certainly better than the Eurozone. So here you have to be careful. This is China. You have to use the right axis. For the US, UK, Eurozone, you have to use the left axis. Just a difference from starting points, of course, with China. But if we look at the Eurozone, the UK, really, really terrible performance. The US is still doing better, better businesses, different environment, 
still has the reserve currency of the world, better technology. So that's the reason. And that's also the reason why the stock market did better. Europe, I don't know, we'll discuss it a little bit more, but looks doomed. So we'll see how it will pan out there. China, it is expected that will keep growing. And then if we look at the long-term drivers of economic growth, things are not that great. So we don't have more growth in population in developed worlds, which is not that great. And these things are getting lower and lower. Plus, a lot of the growth is allowed because of low interest rates and low inflation. If that changes, if this consumption gets hit, then you also will not see growth for a long time. And we can also see stagflation for the next 10 years. That's also a possibility. If you look at government spending, yes, there is government spending, but it is based on debt. Borrowing will stay there for a longer term. This is assuming no recession ever more, which is insane, which is crazy. This is certainly non-sustainable. And when you have to borrow to cover for interest rate, especially if interest rates go higher, then that's usually called the Ponzi scheme. And that's something definitely not sustainable. But then again, if you own businesses, the stock market, the S&P 500, 40% revenues globally, 60% for the US. If the Fed can't raise rates, perhaps people will flock even more into stock markets looking for protection from inflation. And that's a reason, a possibility why the market can't really crash. And even if there is stagflation, it's even better to be in the stock market than in other. It will be volatile, I'm sure about that. I wish I could give you a direction for the stock market. That's impossible. Nobody can give you that. But volatility is certain. And I'm looking forward to looking at what's going on, what will happen, and sharing that with you over the next decades. If you look at government debt to GDP, emerging markets have lower levels than aging developed markets, which means there will likely be a long-term shift there. Also, consumer finances that are the base of that consumption look great, everyone is rich, but this is all financially engineered, and we have already discussed that the net worth has doubled in 15 years, but that's mostly based on financial assets that go up as interest rates go down. If the thing reverts, then everything will look very, very ugly. Consumption, driving everything is a big risk that I see. Of course, low interest rates have made the rich richer. The income share of the top 10% of the population has exploded and keeps going up. So that's also something that might impact long-term economics. But if we look at economic measures and recession risks, it is incredible. Everything looks so great. Everything looks so good. And the Fed is thinking about inflation, about rate hikes, which means everything is great. Of course, if we look at unemployment, Germany, the United States are doing great, but these, com these countries are doing really, really bad. Italy, what's that? 9% unemployment. And that's Fran France, okay, now a little bit better. Spain is terrible. This is really something to think about. And that's why also I think Europe is in the worst place of the developed countries. So this can be sustained. We'll see what piece of the House of Cards will fall first, but this is again a risk that we have to keep in mind. Eurozone debts to GDP are going higher and higher as the ECB is printing money. And the focus there is without next recessions, you bet on that with such high unemployment that things will be stable. But I know that there will be more recessions. You? And then if we compare global growth, Eurozone, China, US, you can see how expectation is for China to do better over time. To conclude on the economy, everything looks great. So now is the time to buy insurance and to protect yourself from what might happen. When the house is on fire, it's not the time to buy insurance. 
if you want to be protected, if you expect volatility, if you expect, I don't know, you have to see for yourself, we are all different, you have to see how your financial goals are protected in relation to what's going on in the world long term. And then you don't have people now, when I say something like this, all we immediately think, okay, tomorrow I have to do everything uh, in five minutes, brush my teeth, uh, restructure my portfolio, and then go on with my life. No, it's something you think over the long term. It's a long term, 10 year process. But you have the opportunity to start thinking about what's going on. The thing is that that financial engineering and that works up till the moment. So everything looks great, 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 and then they lose control, and then everything falters extremely quickly. When will that happen? How long will this money printing, this perception of value in the developed market currencies persist globally? That's the answer we have to find or wait for. Ray Dalio just came with a new book, World Changing Order. I'm just getting it into the mail. I can't wait to read it and then continue to think about just the risks and rewards depending on individual positions. Something to be discussed over the coming years. The point is that all this looks great as it seems there is no cost. There has been no cost of keeping interest rates at zero for 10 years. That's, of course, a lie because there is a cost and that cost is emerging. And the cost is inflation has been emerging, which means, okay, now things start to get interesting. If we look at core inflation, this is for the US, we are now at a level that hasn't been seen since 1981. I was born in 1983, so look how things change over time. For 40 years, no, 38, I'm not 40 yet, but for 40 years, nothing, nobody expected, everything is great. And now, boom, lo and behold, here comes the surprise. And I've discussed inflation in many videos over time. So why it is smart to be prepared for inflation, because they will print more money when situation comes. How just 5% inflation per year gives you an advantage over time if you have that, if you have that. But now we have inflation and now I get the question, Sven, how to protect from inflation? Well, now, now again, when the house is on fire, now it's a little bit late. So now it is about owning businesses that will do good no matter what at a great price. But if commodities were down the drain two years ago, a year ago, I think natural gas was very low last October, if you bought protection then, now you're doing well. Now we have to look at other things. Of course, the returns when things are higher will be lower. That's mathematics. And with inflation at 7%, we'll see whether it will stay there. Uh, everyone was saying it's transitionary. Now it isn't transitionary. It will be higher. It will be allowed to be higher because if not, you can service those debts, etc. But the dollar is getting stronger on expectations of higher interest rates. However, the US trade balance, so the US is buying more, it's getting even more negative, even after the fuss about trading and sanctions and whatever, which was really, really interesting. So this is the real situation and that's how it is. The yuan is getting slowly stronger, so we'll see whether it will shift but for now not, but when it does, it will shift extremely fast, if it shifts at all. Projections, of course, all depends on interest rates. We'll see what the Fed will be able to do. That's impossible to know. Of course, tapering also, injecting money into the system for now, and this is something very important. Great financial crisis, the biggest crisis since 1930s. Look at the injection of money. Uh, slow, slow, a little bit here. And now COVID, the injection of money is four times the one that saved us for from the financial crisis. So that is insane. And my question is, okay, what will happen in the next crisis? Will there be a next crisis? Of course, crises are natural, cycles. So the next crisis, they will have to increase the balance sheet again. 
two times, three times, four times, and that will be the one that really hits. Now we'll see when this situation passes, everything great, but then the one thing to worry about is the next one, which nobody thinks about, but I assure you, will come. And the central bank balance sheets, the forecast is for them to just remain stable. Policy rates to go higher. Of, of course, Europe can't increase interest rates. That's impossible. And we'll see how this game ends. The US has some power. The UK is already, has already done that. So we'll see how this game turns out. But one thing is sure, if you look at real investment returns for a 10-year US treasury, it's negative 3%. So you're investing for 10 years and you know that you will, if things stay like those are, you will lose 30-40% of your purchasing power. That's insane. Half of your pension fund is invested in such an insane scheme. So that's also a big risk brewing on the horizon. Also here, if you look at the current yield curve, 1% with inflation of 3, 4, 5%, then you know you are losing money. And this is the Fed's result only because they are buying the treasuries, only because of that interest rates are lower. And we'll see for how long will this hold. And you can see that high yields also very, very low. Everything looks as great. Nobody is going bankrupt. So junk bonds at 4%, but so great it has looked also in 2008. And then there is a surprise because the risk accumulates and then somewhere it has to blow out. And then you have a situation that has to be managed, but the managing now gets really impossible with interest rates already that low. And with that higher, higher and higher, that's simply a burden that can't be dealt with. Expectations are for tapering, no more injections in, of money. Of course, for how long will that last? We will see. The situation is that we have inflation a little bit less in Asia in relation to history, but inflation there is and nobody can predict where it will go. As we said, at some point this will not work again and that's again a risk we have to accept and deal with and see how it best fits us over time. It's all about trust. For now, someone is trusting the US government to give them a loan at 3.5% negative returns, real returns, happy to lose money. That's how strong the trust is, similar in Europe with our pension funds and everything. We'll see for how that, that will last. I wish I could give you a prediction. This will happen on October 2023, but nobody is that smart. The fact is that everyone is behaving like there will never ever again be a recession, which we'll see over time. And US stocks are going higher, higher and higher. And now the question is, will you invest in something that goes lower, lower and lower and gets cheaper because everyone is chasing those US stocks? Will you be the fool? Do you have the guts to go away from the herd or not? That's again a decision you have to make. And we can discuss the information and then you will see what best fits you. Of course, growth is cheaper. But then again, those are not sexy technology companies. Those are all companies or industrials or something like that that doesn't have the capacity to grow as others. Valuation dispersion, you have cheaper stocks with a P ratio of 12, 15 in the S&P 500, but you also have those extremely expensive in the market. So there is really discrepancy there that has been emphasized over the last year. Then if you look at global markets, the biggest weight is in the United States. This was 55% two quarters ago when we did this overview. Now it's 61%. So more and more money is going into United States stocks. The market is, has outperformed anything else. But this is again cyclical. But again, you can't predict what the Fed will do and what will happen. If you look at valuations US to the world, we are at two and a half more standard deviations. So the world is much cheaper than the United States. The dividend yields are higher. 
the valuations in China with better economic growth, emerging markets are much lower. And if we look at returns, have been similar 10% their total returns, of course, including the boom in the S&P 500. So if this reverts, these returns will go higher compared to the others. And then you have to see, okay, do I dare to invest here looking for a higher margin of safety or are just keep on following the herd, investing at higher and higher valuations, hoping that the Fed will keep protecting me. If we look at what's going on in the world and what will happen over the next 10 years, there is a billion and something people entering the middle class that will increase demand. We have China, the rest of Asia, India. Now, this doesn't mean you have to invest just in those businesses and businesses there. Corporations are global now. Apple is selling phones all over the world. So that's also a way to be exposed to what's going on there in Asia. So again, it's not something you do over a minute. It's something you build a portfolio structure over a decade. Urbanization, there is so much potential here and you have to see whether you can find value. Now, with the sentiment, there is plenty of value. Global GDP shares are growing. China, India, Eurozone, US has starting to lose its position in the market. So this is something you might want to think as protection to the risks we have mentioned out there. China will keep on growing. There is that, of course, the government stimulus and everything. But with growth, you can still protect that. Perhaps China will get into a euro position 10, 20 years down the road, but that's still 10, 20 years and not relatively immediate. And then, of course, following the herd, just to give you a comparison, if we look at investment flows by income, so many people, so those that make 0 to 20k a year that maybe shouldn't be even investing have increased their investments but six times over the last month. Over the last year, those that make less than 100,000 have increased by 2x to 3, 4x. So the herd is strong. Everyone is commenting here, clicking the defining what the news will tell you and give you as an information and therefore there is 7x much more noise that can skew the view on fundamentals and that's why I do this video. So be careful with the noise out there. Conclusion as always this is a value investing channel so it is about a margin of safety thinking about each investment you have seeing okay what happens if it goes wrong what happens if the risks materialize? What happens if it goes well? What happens if the risks don't materialize? The risk and reward. And then seeing how that fits your financial goals. The more you look, the better you will find. The more stones you turn, the better investments that fit you, you will find. Thanks for watching. For more content like this, we'll, this was an overview. We'll do more specific investment ideas when I find them with my research. So please subscribe if you have enjoyed this and I'll see you in the next video.